Good morning. Where are you guys at? I'm up at 7 a.m. This is the earliest I've been up in a long time. Wow. No wonder it's a bit of a fumbly start to the day. That's early. No, I've never actually done one where the host sends me the Zoom. I always send it, so I don't... I mm -hmm. must right, there's send. something in there. We're both in New York. Oh, excellent. Welcome to the show. Let there be talk. Uh, you guys are, uh, uh, I don't know, over 700 uh, episode of my show, Let There Be Talk. And uh, immediately I had to have you guys on once I saw this film. It is... Uh, one of the darkest films I've ever seen as far as a, uh, uh, a documentary. Um, let's get into it. How did it start? And you both directed it. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. You haven't seen Capturing the Freedmen's, obviously. <laughs> and I was thinking of what other. <laughs> well, hold on. I've seen a lot of dark documentaries. As far as the rock and roll world and the truth and honesty in this thing, and, you know, usually people pull punches on this, you know, but this one is full on. It, it is a journey. It and we pulled punches. You did. <laughs> That's, I can't even imagine what was left out on this. Now let's, let's introduce yourselves and tell them the name of the film and what we're talking about here. Well, I'm Svetlana Zill. I'm Alexis Bloom, and the title of the film is Catching Fire, the story of Anita Pallenberg. That's our well, film. If people don't know who Anita Pallenberg was, she was uh, a, a girlfriend of many members of the Rolling Stones, uh, starting with Brian Jones, and then moving on to Keith, and maybe a little dabbling there with uh, Mick Jagger during the filming of performance. Uh, which is left kind of vague there, but uh, she was a soldier in the 60s and uh, 70s rock and roll world. She was, and we always conceive of her as like, you know, she was she was certainly a muse. She inspired a lot of songs, but she, everyone we spoke to said she was a leader rather than a follower. So she spoke, you know, four or five languages, they spoke one, they've not really traveled that much. And she sort of dragged them around by their ear for a while um, until everyone got so messed up, uh, they came to a skidding halt. Messed up is the, the politically correct way, I guess, of saying that. But uh, this is a raw look inside the behind world of the Rolling Stones that I was kind of shocked uh, that it was... Um, Put out, I don't know, did you have to get some okay from the Stones camp? No, we we didn't really go through official channels in that way. We worked very closely with Marlon Richards, who is Anita's son uh, with Keith. And he's an executive producer of the film. And, and he provided us with this incredible archival material and her drafts of her unpublished memoir, um, and yeah, we we made it we made it with the collaboration of the family, I would say, more than an official it, it, corporate. Yeah, yeah. but when, to your question, did we have to get their OK? We didn't we didn't have to get Marlon's OK. He didn't have uh, any creative control over it, but we did show it to Jane Rose. In fact, you know, we, we did kind of had to give that their, their OK because we showed it to Jane Rose who's Keith's long-standing manager. Um, yeah. And she was great. Uh, she was very supportive of the film. So they were great. We didn't send it to the lawyers and kind of the whole apparatus uh, until, well, we didn't ever send it to them. We just, we just dealt with the Richards family. Yeah, I think uh, I worked for the Stones for four years. And so I think that at this point, level in their career um it's it's great to see some other stories because other than say a documentary like cocksucker blues which got shelved right away right um, it's been a pretty shiny you know glossy view of the rolling stones and i feel like that's really probably controlled by Mick Jagger of like hey let's you know let's keep this kind of uh cool but 
interesting story because there were uh, women back then that were muses for these rock and rollers. Because if you look at Anita, when she comes into the Stones camp, Keith is rather shy. He is a, uh, you know, kind of an introvert and stuff. And by the time she gets around him after Brian, he really kind of blossoms into this incredible songwriter and rock star by wearing her clothes and he's and she's dressing him and and really his fashion sense comes from her her being around Andy Warhol and that whole New York scene and everything she had just vibe you know yeah yeah now when this uh this book that she wrote was it just shelved and she did she shop it around or anything no, she didn't. And she didn't finish it in like typical Anita style. She wasn't um, she wasn't that career focused. She was sort of more of a disruptor. So she kind of wrote pages here and pages there and a few chapters and a few different drafts. And she deliberately, I think, decided not to. So there's a great line. Remember, Svet, she was like, oh, everyone's coming out with with biographies. If like Posh Spice can write one, I don't want to. But she left them, uh, all the pages and the chapters, for someone to find. So we think that Marlon, I mean, Marlon came to us and said, I'm pretty sure my mum wanted her story out. She just thought it wasn't classy to do it while she was alive. And she hated doing press. Mm -hmm. So she, she didn't want to be asked questions. And I think that's why she sort of held it all back. She kind of wanted to tell her story, but she didn't want all the things that come with a polished package memoir and shopping it around and having to talk to the public. Now, how did you guys get involved and what is your uh, background? Have you made other films before this one? Because it's fantastic. This film is assembled, amazing. It has great flow. The footage is very arty. It looks beautiful. And um, it, it's a it's a fantastic documentary. Hey. Hey, thank you. <laughs> yes, we've we've both worked in in documentaries for a number of years and we met working at a company actually I'm in the office right now at, at a company in Lower Manhattan called Jigsaw Productions and we were each working on different projects at the time but met each other uh just, you know, through working in this office and Marlon initially approached Alexis to make make the documentary and pretty quickly after she she brought me into the fold, which has been great. I made a film called Bright Light starring Carrie Fisher and Debbie Reynolds, which is like a behind the scenes of old Hollywood. You know, it's a, it's also a family story. It's um, mother and daughter. And it has some, it, you know, it has, it, it has, I wouldn't say parallels, but there's elements that kind of talk to each other. With um, honesty and a kind of rawness, I think, to that story that that definitely speaks to this one it, yeah it's not all bright shiny bright shiny glossy lovely fl uh, fame but uh so i know svet's been working i mean you've worked with loads of people uh errol morris and morgan spurlock and alex and everyone and we've known each other for a long time and this was just something that appealed to both of us immensely so you know, it was a it was a small sort of art film. Svetlana is amazing at archive and came up that way um, and knew exactly what to do with it. And um, so it was kind of like a really natural collaboration. We've both done like more. I don't know, like bigger political docs and stuff like that once. And, you know, as we just relished this more granular, as you say, sort of arty deep dive. Now, when you start to, uh, when you come on and you're going to do this film, a lot of the footage is incredible. Did Marlon have this footage? Uh, because there's stuff I have not seen at all. So. Yeah, yeah. All of that Super 8 footage is like a gold mine. Marlon did have that footage that Anita actually had the wherewithal to realize. It, I don't know if you remember Sandro Sursok in the film, their friend from Switzerland. Yes, yes. She, she actually had the, the foresight to say, you know, they literally were running out of apartments on fire. I mean, they were living a very chaotic life and 
she had this suitcase of all of these reels of Super 8 film that had been shot over the years. You know, it was basically Anita and Keith and Mick had these Super 8 cameras that they were passing back and forth, just recording their adventures together. And, and Anita thought, oh, Sandro's a responsible guy. Maybe he should hold on to this footage for us so we don't lose it in a fire or, you know, it'll get stolen or, or left behind somewhere. So, so Sandro held on to that footage for a long time, and then and then gave it back to Marlon, who who allowed us to use decades. it. The, yeah, for decades. Yeah, she said, "Yes, Wes, you're sensible. <laughs> you're responsible." <laughs> yeah. He was a giant heroin addict himself, and like the original Swiss punk, he was in a band, the Zero Heroes. But I think just everything is relative. So in comparison, he, he was, was the responsible one. Yeah. <laughs> That's insane, man. I mean, this story is just, it's just unreal. And it is very dark. It starts to just unravel into a, a drug world, of course, starting with uh, Brian Jones and Anita just being on acid all the time and, and Brian abusing her. These are stories that you just don't hear about. Like, they're just on acid, like daily. It's crazy. And then here comes Keith to save her. Let me get you out of this acid house and uh, we'll take this crazy long ride. It's 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 amazing, man. Now, how does Scarlett Johansson come in on this? What a score this is. She's she's reading basically kind of the pages of the biography and taking you through the whole film. It it's seamless. It's beautiful. Great. I mean, she was just she was just generous. You know, we were we tried to. We tried to do a number of different voices. Anita had a very distinct uh, sort of Pygmalion voice that was sometimes Italian and sometimes more German and sometimes a bit British because she lived in, in London for so long. And we couldn't find the right voice. We couldn't find an Italian that didn't sound kind of reductionist or like the German sounded too German. So in the end, we decided just to jettison the idea of 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 having a narrator. Oh, I think Lex wrote. Did she freeze for you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can I can finish that thought <laughs> while we okay. get her back. We jettisoned the idea of of the emphasis and focus being on imitating an accent and just went with who is going to be believable in this incredible Super 8 footage that we have? What voice is going to match her kind of intensity and intelligence and sexiness and allure? And, and we landed on Scarlett, who, you know, again, was super generous with her time and, um, and came in and did a read for us. But yeah, did it was a process for us to, to sort out. Um, did somebody know her and were they able to, you know, hey, are you interested in doing this? Because it's such a cool project for her to be involved in. Yeah, it's funny. Um, Alexis's husband is Fisher Stevens, and they had recently worked together on a project and they sort of knew each other socially for a bit. So that was the the initial connection. But I also I went to elementary school with Scarlett here in New York City. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so we had that connection from decades ago, though that was not the one that we led with. That was just a nice sort of surprise <laughs> element. Um, but yeah, so we we had those mutual friend connections. Now, what about the Keith uh, VO? Is that some stuff from his book uh, audio, or did he come in and, and talk? He, we did an interview with him. We did an audio only interview with him here in New York at Electric Lady Studios. Um, and that that was a process, too. I mean, that was not um, I think it took a while for him to consider if he was really wanting to participate in the film. And then and then once he did, we we set up the interview and and yeah, that's an original interview that we did with him. Um, but again, you know, it's not a lot of the things he spoke about. He has written about in his book. Um, but he doesn't often do those kinds of interviews. I mean, you really only hear him, I think, do interviews when it comes to the band and, you know, they're about to go back on tour and sort of promoting the Stones. It's definitely usually not such a personal conversation. I think one of the heaviest things in the film, and, I, you know, I remember reading Keith Richards, uh, the book is called Life. Yeah. Uh, I do not remember this 
and and correct me if I'm wrong, did he actually mention the baby that passed away? Yeah, he does. God, I don't remember yeah. that because when that part of the film hits, it's so dark because both of them are completely rock bottom on drugs. And, and he goes on stage that night. And when that part of the film hits, it's kind of like, oh my God. And then Anita's, or, you know, in her book, she's like, apparently he had the gig of his life, you know? And it's just like, wow, this is heavy. I think Marlon says that actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. it, it is apparently crazy. Wow. Well. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a it's an incredibly dark and tragic episode. And that has I mean, I, you know, that's the kind of thing that never goes away, that kind of pain. Um, he does write about it in, in the book. Um, yeah. And of course, we had it was something we we needed to include in the film because it was such a huge um, event in Anita's life. And she writes about it a lot. Yeah, because that really kind of uh, took a toll on her and kind of uh, finally changes her to get out of the whole drug haze. And this is, would have been her third child. She has Marlon and then she has the daughter. What's her name? Angela. Angela. And then the third child that passes away. And it's a it's a drug haze the whole entire time that and the um, the kind of ranch hand guy she's seeing who uh, kills himself. By then, I'm like, this couldn't get any darker. <laughs> you yeah. Know? It, yeah. It, is, it is a balls out ride, man. Yeah, it's um, yeah. And there are there's other, you know, there are a lot of very heavy things that happened to her in her life and the amount of drugs that they were all on and the the chaos of that. I mean, I think it was something that we were very conscious of. We really thought a lot about calibrating the and how to you know, to, to to have to contain that much tragedy in one film, we were very conscious of, I, we hope this isn't just going to be too much, but also we had to be honest about what really happened in her life. So. Well, sorry. that's, what, that's what I loved about this film. It was so refreshing because it was, uh, there was no gloss, you know, and to be able to see this uh, Phoenix rise from the ashes, so to speak, after all of this tragedy, she kind of finally gets clean. And the last half of her life kind of becomes this muse for other people like Kate Moss and the whole modeling world and, and all of that. And uh, it, it's just a, an amazing story, this woman. It's crazy. And just think, this is just one person in the rock and roll world, you know? Yeah, we didn't want to do that other kind of biography. You put your finger on it. You know, there are there are a lot of biographies now, rock and roll biographies or or other that are quite um, sanitized, you know, and they just show the glamour and the success and like, a, you know, a tiny bit of kind of um, like insouciance maybe, but it's rock and roll is not like that. You know, and the world is not like that, but particularly rock and roll. So when we start out, we set out to make this, we were like, we're, we're not doing that. When we're, we're not doing the, isn't it great? Look at all these fantastic haircuts and gyrating hips. We were like, you know, what's the, what's the real texture of it? You know, who says what to sort of whom and how does that spin off over time? And I think that for kids in particular, growing up in this situation is definitely not, is definitely complicated. And people must say to them all the time, oh, you're so lucky. You know, you grew up with Keith Richards as your dad. It's so amazing, you know, all with famous actors. And the reality of that has got to be more complex. Oh, my God. I mean, you know, Marlon to be alive, because, you know, there's such a... Uh, uh, a cliche of like, you know, my parents weren't around, they were junkies. I had no, you know, no supervision. Uh, they, a lot of them take themselves out or they go out on drugs and stuff like that. But Marlon, there he is standing uh, tall and producing this footage that is de definitely super raw about his mother and his father. And that is a radical ride. Was there anything 
that you saw that you didn't put out like because you know it's pretty balls out was there something where you're like we better leave that out yes there was a lot but i don't know that we can we can <laughs> go into it because there's i mean you know the the film is already long right so you know it doesn't feel long though by the way i want to know thank that. you that's good to hear yeah. she went to jamaica she got arrested in jamaica um that was like in crazy crazy shit went down in jamaica but from the so from the big things and big misadventures um to little ones to marlon saying to us you know there were needles in the flower pots or she used to sit there like flicking cigarettes at people you know just you know um uh crimes and misdemeanors you know there were the big crimes and the tiny mis misdemeanors on a daily basis there were there were plenty yeah the fires yeah the, the fires i was just gonna say there were many fires house fires set by cigarette butts people falling asleep smoking they yeah, literally no. were running out of burning houses um marlon but... doesn't drive you can see he has a scar on his forehead because in so many car accidents with his Angela parents. doesn't drive either. Neither of them drive. Yeah. Oh, Svet, what about that story about skiing we had in there for so long? Remember? Oh, well, well, they, did, they did love going skiing. That was crazy to see these junkies out on the slopes in Switzerland. <laughs> you know, like what? Like all of a sudden we became skiers and we love skiing. And you're like, this is fucking nuts. <laughs> That's total rock star shit. Like get all high and go skiing. There was a great story of a um, storm. Marlon and uh, Anita and Keith were skiing and there was a snowstorm and Keith decides to go back down the mountain and Anita and Marlon want to carry on skiing. So they carry on skiing and Marlon describes this incredible storm. Like a whiteout basically happens while they're on the mountain in Switzerland. So you know it's like real deal yeah. <laughs> weather front on a massive mountain. <laughs> And uh, Anita digs a hole for them. He says, it's remarkable. My mum just was incredible. Her, She doesn't panic. She's like, right, Marlon. And she digs a huge hole for them and they get inside the hole. And that's how she protects them. And Keith is at the bottom of the mountain worrying. And as soon as it's safe enough, he sends mountain patrol to go and look for them. And they're fine. They climb out of the hole and ski down. And wow. he says, imagine your mom on heroin doing this. So it shows sort of what kind of person she was. No offense to Marianne Faithful. We love her. And yeah. you know, all due respect, but she was definitely not digging a hole. No, you know? oh, no, no. She, mm -hmm. she actually, you know, got the hell out of there. She was kind of like, this is, this is crazy. By the time they're on that cruise, she's like, I'm out of here. <laughs> you know? Um, let me ask you about, uh, of course, the Stones' greatest record in almost everybody's eyes is Exile on Main Street. This was when they go into exile in France. Keith gets a house and everybody and their grandma goes over there and parties. I have an incredible coffee table book from a guy, a kid that shot these photos there. And it's like a prized possession of my book collection. But to see some of that footage, was there other footage in there of that time? Because everybody was there. John Lennon, uh, you know, uh, Grant Parsons. Everybody came over there and just partied nonstop. What a what a fucking scene that was. Did you have more footage of that? There actually isn't a lot of footage of that time period. There are beautiful photographs um, that were mainly taken by Dominique Taro. That's probably That's my book. Yeah. the book that you have. Yeah. Um, but there there really is not a lot of footage of that of that episode. It's mainly those incredible photographs. It's so insane too, because like the skiing, uh, here they are in that book, you know, Keith is water skiing. <laughs> it's hilarious. They're, they're just out there water skiing in between making this record. But uh, that is a, an incredible time for the Stones because that's, you know, the holy grail of, of records. And uh, 
I had no idea. I knew that they were in tax exile, but I didn't know that Keith was running from, I knew that he was arrested a few times on drugs, but I didn't know he was running from, you know, country to country. It was wild that he could, you could never do that now. You would just, passports would be revoked. You couldn't go anywhere. Yeah, it's, time. it's true. Now, the film is done. It, it, it comes out, what, May, May 9th or something? It's May 3rd at the IFC Theater in New York, and then it'll it'll also be released digitally. Also and in LA and sort of 10 markets, actually, Svet, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I just don't know which theaters exactly, but May 3rd, it's out. And what's the platforms? Um, Magnolia's releasing it uh, in theaters, which is great. So you can see it on the big screen. Um, and then it's going, it's streaming. I think Hulu will get it. I'm not sure whether Hulu gets it on May 3rd, but you know, it, it becomes available on lots of different platforms. If you Google it and streaming, it'll be like, you know, on YouTube and Google and Hulu oh, and God, the whole proliferation of them. Oh yeah. Chelsea just said Hulu later and then pay-per-view first. Yeah. yeah. When you guys get all the footage and you get the whole movie assembled, from the day you start till the day it's done, how long was this? Because it seems like a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had COVID in there as well. So, oh. you know, I, it's almost not a true, you know, timeline because I mean, I remember going to Italy with Marlon in, when was it, April 2020? We first spoke about it January 2020. Wow. We first yeah. talked about it and Alexis was visiting Marlon and, and getting to meet him. And we didn't really start until summer of 2021, I guess. It's years, yeah. <laughs> it's three, it's sort of like a three three years. Yeah. I'd say God, it's crazy you know I just wanted people to know that because uh it's crazy the dedication it takes to make a great documentary I've seen a lot of good ones and I know people Judd Apatow doing the Avid Brothers documentary which was really incredible to me um and I talked to him for a while about it and it's just like you know, it's just like this thing's just like a five year. You're just working and then you go somewhere else and work on something and then you come back to it because you're waiting for like maybe the Keith Richards interview. Mm -hmm. OK, we got the Keith Richards interview. Now we got to figure out where to insert that, because like I said, the flow is amazing. It feels like you're rolling and Scarlett as Onita, and then you got Keith, you got Marlon. It feels like they've just sitting there in the room telling this story, which is a, a, a huge magic trick to pull off. Great. Well, thanks to our editors for that. We had great editors. We had a great team. All of these films, you're right, they're a labor of love. And it's truly a collaboration. People say that, but this is like going down in a submarine with people and you've got your crew and you're the only ones in the submarine. And it's impossible to make these films without other people being just as sort of maniacal about finishing it as you are. Unreal. Now you get it all done. You sit down with Marlon and he watches. Now, is he watching it through the whole process or does he see the final product? He saw a close to final product. He didn't he didn't watch all of the cuts along the way. We showed it to him at the very end. And, and we what, actually we didn't sit with him while he watched it. We sort of we left the we went down the road to a uh, um and had an an anxious lunch, I guess, while we waited for him to <laughs> we were at a pub down the road from his place in England <laughs> waiting. Um he, his reaction, I mean, you know, there's of course always little notes. I think there, Jamaica, like Alexis was talking about, that was a, an episode that I think he had, was hoping would be in the film, but ultimately understood why we couldn't include every, every story in her life. You just have to make choices when you're making films like this, but he was incredibly supportive and was, 
Um, and I think was really an act of bravery. I mean, you were talking about it earlier. It's a very vulnerable thing for him to do to have this story about his family and his part of his childhood be told. And it gets it gets rough. It gets very dark. And I think he was he was glad that we embraced that darkness and I think encouraged us to lean into it as much as possible to be as honest as possible about the story. Well, it is insane. I mean, I think something that sat with me the uh, the most was when the ranch hand shoots himself after watching Deer Hunter and he was always raised of get rid of the evidence, meaning drugs or whatever, even like a five, six, seven, eight year old, get rid of this flesh stuff or whatever. So he gets rid of the gun and you're just like, this is the heaviest shit I've heard in a long time. Cause I'm a giant stones guy, you know? So I'm just like, I'm engulfed in this, like, Oh my God, how does this sit with this guy all these years? And then he's got to watch this film that he's helped made. It's, it's, it's uh, glorious, and um, the guy's a hero for for being able to show this stuff, man. He's an honest dude. You know, he's just, that's his nature. He's not one of those people who uh, is conscious of public relations and, you know, how things look. He's a straight shooter. And I think, actually, that characterizes Anita. She was absolutely no bullshit she never had any airs or graces and she told it like it was and Keith to a certain extent too I mean I think there's people around Keith who uh you know protect him from you know having bad press or just you know protect him from from interacting too much with kind of I don't know you know social media and stuff like that so he can be really honest in his own small personal world but he he is he's not a you know he's not a he's not a messenger he just he's he says it like he feels so I think Marlon's kind of a product of his parents in that way he's also got a really lovely wife you know very stable very stable life now you know beautiful wife drop dead beautiful and super kind and they cook and they have a great garden and they have great kids. And I think if you're from that position of relative security now, you can explore the stuff in your past. I think if he had a more jagged, crazy life now, it might his past might have more of a hold over him. But he's good now. You know, he's got well, a great life. I think the interesting thing about the Rolling Stones and uh, the whole Anita thing is when you're starting out as a band, uh, the outlaw, you know, the mm -hmm. press of all the outlaw movement is helpful. It's like, oh my God, you know, the people, we got to see these guys, they're the real deal. It's insane. And, you know, later on in life, it's like, hey, we got to get rid of that stuff now, you know? And, and, and also I think bands in the eighties and nineties, a lot of that was fabricated by publicists to make these uh, you know, these rock and roll dangerous people that really weren't. But when you watch the Stones and this this documentary, you're like, this shit is the real deal. This is like super dark and drugs grabbed them. They were able to make some of the greatest rock and roll of all time. And for most part of it survived. All of them survived except for Brian, you know? All yeah. of them, Charlie passed from uh, cancer, rest in peace. And, and, but it's still alive. It's wild, you know, to think about because that shit is real. When they're running from country to country, strung out and shit is happening, man, it mm -hmm. is, it is, uh, it is a great, great film. I called everyone, you know, uh, that are stones freaks like me. And I was like, oh my God. I don't know how this is coming out, but wait till you see it. <laughs> it's not easy. Thank you. Not easy to avoid the lawyers. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Well, a couple questions now before we get out of here. Uh, it was kind of vague. Does she sleep with Jagger? I mean, she does. It does. I think it. It. We 
we don't dwell on it, but we do acknowledge that she did. Wow. She was, you I, know, I mean, she did. I, and I I mean I'm, watch, I'm watching yeah. and I'm like, wait, yeah. I think so. You yeah. know, wow, three stones under her belt. Or <laughs> fucking, the 60s, man. That's yeah. a powerful woman, man. You know? Yep. And then my other question is, um, you're talking about Jamaica. Is this after Keith leaves her or why she's with Keith? Oh, they were together during that period. <laughs> I, I mean, like, I, it, this sounds like a grim, sto a grim story, the way you tell you, like, no, they were together. Well, because it's not just one moment, too. I mean, we're talking about over the course of many years and many, it's not like there was one trip to Jamaica or there's, um, and they also had their own kind of relationship, too, right? It's not... Um, you know, it was the 60s. It's, you know, he make he doesn't hide the fact that he had his, you know, different girlfriends in different ports. It's not like, a, yeah, um, you know, we're not, it's not the most puritanical bunch that we're talking about here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, Keith writes about it in life, Jamaica. Yeah. It was very formative to his musical experience as well. Um, they were definitely together. They had the kids, right? So that defines it. Marlon and Angela were both in Jamaica. But then he goes back to London with Stash and then shit goes down and then he comes back and it's like back and forward. A lot of back and forth. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of travel. And yeah, that would have almost been a great name for this documentary. Shit goes down. It goes it's down. Like, oh, my God. Does it go down? Uh, and then it comes back up. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's amazing. And um, and I do want to uh, stress uh, on this uh, immensely that. Um, she she pulls it all out and the last half of her life is just incredible. I mean, her whole life's incredible. You know, it's a it, it is the queen is pretty good of yeah. the Queen of England with that cigarette. Like she's out. Like, yeah. Uh they just told me it's going to be at the new art May 10th. So I, I will definitely go see it in the theater because I watched it on my computer. And uh, I want to see it on the screen with the sound. Yeah, they're just great music in there. Now, did how'd you get the okay for the music? Did you have to pay for it or? Uh, we did not, <laughs> thankfully, because I don't think we could have afforded it. There's this amazing doctrine called fair use. Oh, yeah, yeah. It has its own very strict, um, you know, rules how much you can use and what circumstance and all of that kind of stuff. So we had our own fantastic lawyer called Jay Ward Brown. If you ever make a documentary and you want a fair use lawyer, I recommend him. Lovely man in Virginia. Um, and we were lucky enough to fair use it. Awesome. Also, I love that two women made this film. That makes it even cooler to me, you know, because... Yeah. Uh, two women making this powerful film about a powerful woman in the rock and roll world, you know, great, great job. Uh, looking forward to seeing it in the theater, new art on May 10th, New York city. I believe they said May 3rd and then eventually Hulu and then the pay per view uh, platforms out there. Do not miss this film people. It, uh, even if you are not a Rolling Stones film, it is a uh, an incredible story of a period of time where rock was king and uh, the people that were around it were radical and artists and it's just pure organic realness. So thank you so much for making this film. I loved it. Thank you, Dean. It's thank great you so talk. much, Dean. Yay. Yeah. Go on, Yay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yes. I, I was as I watched it, I was like, these two women need to make my documentary. Like it, it, whenever I see a great documentary, I'm like, they could tell my story. And that's yeah, not that like some cool. narcissist or or you know, egomaniac, but it takes uh certain filmmakers that understand uh how to tell stories without it just being like, meh, I get it, you know. And then this happened, and then this happened. This just feels like you're on a trip in the 60s with these pirates, you know? And that's what Keith's been his whole life, a rock and roll pirate. And he is the last 
of the real deal, you mm -hmm. know? Absolutely. And like we said, you know, there's handlers around Keith, but the older you get, the more real you you are. You know, when you hang out with old people, you're like, whoa, I don't think you yeah. can see that. And they're yeah. like, ah, yeah, I'm going to be dead soon. So I can tell you the truth. This is truth. People don't like the truth. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> this film is the truth. So thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Dean. Yep, yep. I hope yeah. to see you guys in person one day. Thanks for making the film. And thanks right. for doing the podcast.